Welcome to the fifth video lecture of the Lithography Tool Package Training at DTU Nanolab. This lecture is a more detailed look into the photoresist, the substrates and the substrate pretreatment. In an earlier lecture we briefly introduced the photoresist and how we usually cannot directly transfer a pattern into the substrate. Instead we use the photoresist as a kind of middleman. The photoresist can be manipulated in order to transfer our pattern from a pattern mask into the photoresist. The pattern can afterwards be transferred from the photoresist into the substrate. To reiterate, in broad terms, the photoresist consists of three main components. A resin, a photoactive component, and a solvent. The resin is some type of monomer or polymer. The photoactive component, or PAC, is the component that interacts with photons and causes the actual chemical change in the resist. Some photoresists are not actually photoactive. An example of this is resist used for electron beam lithography, which is instead electron active. In these resists the chemical change is caused by inelastic collisions between electrons and the resin polymer. The outcome is essentially the same, it just uses a different type of radiation to cause the chemical reaction. The solvent is added to dissolve the resin, which makes it liquid and easier to work with. In general, resist films will be thermally stable up to approximately 100 degrees Celsius. Resist usually has good chemical resistance against acids and poor resistance against bases. Bases are often used as developer solution, which means that resists are often designed to be etched under controlled circumstances by alkaline solutions. Most resists have poor resistance towards solvents. That's because solvents are already used for dissolving the resin, to make it liquid, and treating a resist film with solvents would simply dissolve the film. There are many different types of photoresist products, and each is designed to produce a specific film thickness. It is sometimes possible to dilute a resist, in order to get a thinner film thickness, but a diluted resist does not always produce the same quality film as the undiluted would have. It is also not possible to concentrate a resist, in order to get a thicker resist film. The best results are often achieved by using the correct resist product for a specific process. At DTU Nanolab we have a wide range of standard resists available to users. Combined these resists cover a wide range of film thicknesses. However, the standard selection does not always suit every project, and users sometimes have to buy special resists better suited for their own projects. Photoresists also differ in the type of radiation they are sensitive to. The standard resists at DTU Nanolab can be grouped by UV sensitive resists, deep UV sensitive resists, and electron beam resists. The deep UV and electron beam resists are only sensitive to their own regime, but some of the UV resists can be sensitive to both deep UV and electrons. A photoresist film has a number of interesting properties. If we look at the attenuation coefficient, which is a measure of how much light is absorbed in the resist, and is correlated with the photosensitivity at different wavelengths, we can get a better understanding of some of the optical properties of the resists. If we compare a standard UV resist, shown in orange, with a standard deep UV resist, shown in purple, we see that the UV resist absorbs light in the UV region, while the deep UV resist does not absorb here at all. Both resists, however, absorbs light in the deep UV region. From this graph we might conclude that the UV resist can be used with both types of radiation, so why even bother with a separate deep UV specific resist? The reality is that there are many more interesting details to the resist than simply the spectral sensitivity, but they are unfortunately beyond the scope of this lecture. Each resist also has what is called a tone, or polarity. The resist tone defines what happens to the resist when it is exposed to radiation. In a positive tone resist, the exposed areas will become more soluble, which means that these parts will be etched away in the development step. The negative tone resist is the opposite of this, and the exposed areas becomes less soluble and will be the parts that remain after the development step. Whether your process requires a positive or negative tone resist can depend on the tools available for processing, as well as the process steps following the lithography steps. The photoactive component is consumed, when it interacts with the photons in the exposure light. This makes some resists more transparent during the exposure, giving the phenomenon the name, bleaching. 
An example can be seen in this graph, where the attenuation coefficient of an unexposed resist, shown in blue, is compared with the coefficient of a fully bleached resist. In these resists, the exposure light is able to penetrate deeper into the resist, without being absorbed and diffracted, enabling exposure of thicker films as well as making the side walls of the resist more vertical. All processing begins with the substrate. A substrate can either be the thing that mechanically holds all the interesting parts you put on top of it, or sometimes the substrate is the interesting part, which is being processed. Typical substrates used in the fabrication lab are silicon wafers, glass wafers and 3-5 wafers. Silicon wafers are the backbone of the semiconductor industry. Glass wafers are commonly used for optical transmission devices and 3-5 wafers are used in many optoelectronics, such as LEDs. The name 3-5 comes from the materials they are made from. These substrates are made of materials from the boron and nitrogen groups in the periodic table. These two groups were once named group 3 and 5 respectfully. Other types of common substrate types are chips, which is just another word for smaller pieces from a bigger wafer, and photomasks. The masks are typically square and are used in certain exposure tools as shadow masks. Silicon substrates are divided into subgroups, based on a number of parameters. Their Miller index crystal orientation, which is either 100, 110, or 111. Their size, which can be either metric or imperial. Most wafers used at DTU Nanolab is metric except for 2-inch wafers, which are imperial. Whether they are polished on one side or both sides. Wafers can also be doped either positively or negatively. After selecting an appropriate substrate, we need to prepare it before the resist coating. This pretreatment, or priming, is a process intended to improve the adhesion of the resist to the surface of the substrate. There are two main problems with the resist adhesion. The first is water. A thin water film forms naturally on any surface in a humid environment, unless that surface has a mechanism to avoid it. It is fundamentally impossible to avoid the formation of this water film. Even if we find a good method for dehydrating our substrate, and we then leave it out in the ambient atmosphere, it will automatically rehydrate in just a few minutes. The problem with the water film on the substrate is that it prevents the resist from adhering properly to the surface. This phenomenon is often seen as film delamination from the substrate surface. The other main problem with resist adhesion is the surface energy of the substrate. If the surface energy is wrong, the resist will not wet properly with the substrate, in much the same way that water will not wet with a hydrophobic surface. The surface energy of the substrate can be measured indirectly, by measuring the contact angle of water droplets on the surface. The surface energy of the substrate must fit with the surface tension of the liquid resist in order for the liquid resist to have good wetting of the substrate surface. But the substrate surface energy must also fit well with the dry resist film, in order to ensure proper adhesion. This turns out to be quite a complicated problem to solve, because any information we can measure about how the liquid resist interacts with the substrate surface, in principle does not tell us anything about how the dry resist film will interact with the substrate. So let's look at how we manage to solve it anyway. We use a tool called a drop shape analyzer, which, as the name suggests, analyzes the shape of droplets. Specifically with this tool we look at the contact angle between a droplet and the surface it sits on. Any surface has a certain surface energy and any liquid has a certain surface tension. When the surface energy is high, the liquid will tend to wet the surface, which spreads the liquid across the surface. Conversely when the surface energy is low, the liquid will tend to oppose wetting, which makes the liquid form droplets on the substrate surface. The bigger the resistance to wetting the liquid has, the more perfectly round these droplets become, which is what we use to indirectly measure the surface energy, by measuring the shape of the droplets sitting on top of it. Unfortunately we encounter a problem when using this method with resists. The liquid resist could potentially be measured using this method, and this would indeed give an indication of the wetting properties of the resist, in its liquid form. But it tells us nothing about how the dry resist film interacts with the surface. Furthermore, 
trying to form droplets with a solid material is nonsensical. Instead we use a clever trick. We first assume that the surface energy of the resist film must match the surface energy of the substrate to get good adhesion of the dry resist film. We then place a droplet of water on top of a resist film and measure the contact angle. This contact angle can now be used as a target angle for measurements on prime substrates, again just using water. Empirical data shows that when these two contact angles are the same, and approximately 70 degrees, the surface energy of the substrate has a good fit with the resists. A very commonly used adhesion promoter is HMDS. This method covers the substrate surface with a monomolecular layer of HMDS. The priming is quite robust and will typically last for several days, perhaps even weeks. Another commonly used priming method is to etch the native oxide of silicon wafers in hydrofluoric acid. This method only works with silicon substrates, and since the substrate will start reoxidizing shortly after the etch, this pretreatment will only last for about 20 minutes. Some processes require that the substrate is thoroughly dehydrated before coating. This is often done by leaving them in an oven for 24 hours. When the substrates are removed from the oven, the ambient humidity will immediately start forming a water film on the surface, so this priming will only last a few minutes. These three priming types are standard procedures for many fabrication processes, and often have well-described and tested process parameters. Other priming methods can also be used, such as plasma activation or liquid adhesion promoter, but these are not standard processes at DTU Nanolab and users have to establish their own process optimization for these, or other, methods. At DTU Nanolab we have two methods available for HMDS priming. Both methods use the same mechanism, called vapor priming, which takes place in a heated vacuum chamber and applies vaporized HMDS to the substrate. HMDS priming is very commonly used for oxide surfaces. HMDS has also been observed to work with nitride surfaces. We have an HMDS oven, where it is possible to process larger batches of substrates, as well as chips. We also have HMDS modules in our automatic spin coaters, which primes a single wafer at a time as part of the automatic processing. The compound in HMDS is a molecule called hexamethyldisilazane. The first step in the HMDS vapor priming process is to remove the water film on the surface of the substrate. This is done by heating the substrate in a vacuum. HMDS vapor is then injected into the process chamber, where it interacts with the hydroxy groups in the surface oxide which breaks the amine bond in the HMDS molecule, and the now free silazane groups bind to the oxygen on the substrate surface. The process creates an ammonia byproduct, which is ejected from the process chamber when it is purged, at the end of the process. The result is a substrate surface which has become more hydrophobic. Another common priming type is to etch the native oxide in hydrofluoric acid, commonly known as a BHF dip. The substrate is submerged into a bath of buffered hydrogen fluoride, which is where the name BHF dip comes from. This etches the native oxide layer which forms on all silicon substrates. The BHF priming is limited to silicon substrates. The process works by making fluorine ions interact with the silicon oxide on the substrate surface. The interaction removes the silicon oxide completely from the surface and forms two new molecules in suspension, silicon fluoride and water. The reaction consumes the fluorine ions in the solution, which would normally reduce the etch rate over time but the buffer in the solution maintains the concentration of available fluorine ions, which makes the etch rate constant and the process controllable. Dehydration is used to remove the naturally forming water film adsorbed to the substrate surface. Some substrate types require a high amount of dehydration before coating, due to water molecules being trapped inside films or oxides. An example of this is glass wafers, which are made entirely, or mostly, of silicon oxide, depending on the type of glass. Thin films can usually be dehydrated in a matter of a few minutes, while thicker films and glass wafers often need to be baked for many hours. It is not uncommon to bake glass substrates overnight or even longer. The substrate will naturally rehydrate due to the ambient humidity present in the cleanroom air, so this priming method will only last for a few minutes, 
after removing the substrate from the hot and dry atmosphere inside the oven. This concludes the fifth lecture in the lithography TPT. Please continue to the next lecture which is a more detailed look into what happens after the lithography is finished.